um, obviously the next regularly scheduled conversation would be, um, uh, well, in two weeks, would uh, cross over with the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. So I presume it'd be relatively uncontroversial to cancel that meeting. Um, if anyone objects, <laughs> um, uh, we could have a conversation, but um, thoughts? I'd be okay. fine with canceling that. Okay, good. Um, uh, and now next week, next week on the 17th, um, I believe Chris is still out. Um, I will be traveling in Asia and can't uh, commit that my travels won't conflict with this time frame. So um, if another TSC board member would volunteer to run the meeting, that probably would be a good thing. Um, I, is, would there would anyone who's on the TSC on this call be willing to do that? Hang on one second. Oh, sorry, I'll be out next week as well. This is Mick. I Mick was that you volunteering oh, or, or saying you can't make it? I cannot do it. I was I was going to volunteer, but I will actually be on an airplane at the time. Sorry. Okay, we can we can defer this to uh, to an email conversation then to uh, to make sure we have coverage. This uh, is Arno. So I was also going to volunteer, but I'm not sure. I, I cannot guarantee I'll be on time. I expect to be on the call, but I, it makes it difficult for me. To volunteer. Okay. Well, um, then let's take it to uh, to email uh, to to the list to talk about that for us. Um, uh, and it may be that we end up uh, canceling next week as well. Um, although there's there's certainly some balls in the air, so it'd be very nice to get started. Um, uh, it'd be able to make progress on some things. Um, uh, so uh, why don't we move on to the next item? Uh, so we've we've been searching for a space for the uh, Hackfest in December to correspond with uh, the member summit in in New York. Um, so for the fifth and sixth were dates that we had relatively locked in, and and sadly haven't been able to confirm a location yet. We have one more uh, uh, opportunity that we're chasing. I'm sorry, two more opportunities that we're chasing down um, that we will get cl uh, clarity on. Um, probably by early next week, um, uh, but our sense is that you know if we can't confirm the location by by basically Tuesday. Um, I mean, I was hoping this week, but this one of the two options. Um, uh, we'll only know in early next. Um, I'd say if we get to Tuesday and we can't lock it in, then we probably should defer or cancel, essentially cancel the the hack fest for December in New York City. Um, unless anyone here has any other options they can provide um, or believe that you know shorter time notice is acceptable. I, I kind of think since we want people to travel to make this, um, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty essential uh, to give sufficient notice, but uh, um, it, it's not feeling super positive at this point. So um, just wanted to get a pulse of the room and say, you know, a, does anyone have any other ideas? <laughs> um, but B, does anyone basically agree? Does everyone basically I think agree that, uh, you know. Two states that cut off. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's a fine cutoff. I think a lot of the benefit of the, the hack fests is uh, just seeing people face to face and having face to face discussions. Um, and we're going to get that opportunity anyway with the, the members' meetings. Well, not not everybody will be able to make it to the member meeting, um, and I want to be respectful of that. Uh, and you know, we could even coordinate some sort of social gathering. Um, you know, I'll be there Monday, Tuesday, anyway. So perhaps for those who will be in New York, anyway, um, uh, some sort of social gathering open to to anyone. You know, at a um, restaurant somewhere, or I hate to say at a bar because I don't want to promote alcoholism, <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's some sort of a more public. Uh, facing kind of thing. Perhaps there'll even be a meetup we could coordinate at. Um, so there may be something less formal, less full time, that uh, we could, could still be open to the public. Um, I'd still like to do that, and we'll certainly research that possibility. Um, if we don't end up being able to find a location for a hack. 
So if it comes down to the point where we cannot have somebody host in New York, I, before we cancel entirely, I would suggest we ask if there is any other option somewhere else, maybe on the East Coast still, but you know, it could be Boston or somewhere else where maybe somebody can then host. And that would be a good alternative to rather than just cancel the whole event. Uh, true, and we are we have included researching um, uh, commercial spaces. So to answer Jeremy's question in, in chat, one of the options we are pursuing is at a WeWork. Uh, uh, and I do want to thank uh, Renat at Altoros for helping us track that opportunity down. Um, uh, so, so we have been researching commercial uh, uh, locations where you know we have to spend money, <laughs> um, uh, and and been coming up somewhat short on that. I mean, our event team is is pretty good at finding spaces, um, but uh, both the timing is short and and the need is kind of unique. You know, for at least 60 up to 100 people with power and Wi-Fi, uh, with seats that can be reconfigured, it's it's not your typical you know auditorium. Or, or meet up kind of space. So, and for for the daytime as well, which is which is also nice. But um, I, we can put a few more, a little bit more time this week into into locating it. And again, for people who have made travel plans, will be in town. Let's try to find a way we can at least gather informally um, to get the benefits of you know the face to face interaction, even for for a few hours. But we're not giving up hope yet. There's still there's still a few options. And Jeremy, if you have connections to Galvanize, um, that would be that would be interesting. Um, you know, we've we've pursued them through. Um, you know, I know IBM has a relationship with them. I know Pricewaterhouse Coopers has a relationship with them. They're in New York City, so we've tried kind of both those angles in, or at least suggested to our to our friends at those companies. They they you know look into that and haven't heard back yet. Um, uh, if you've got a direct li line into them, that would be that would be interesting. Hi, this is Leonard here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, is the date flexible at all? Must it be either December 5th or 6th? Can we delay for uh, a, a more opportune moment near the holidays, possibly, when we can uh, celebrate <laughs> our achievements uh, and possibly give us more time to find a better venue? Just, just a call. It, that, that was actually, I, I'm not sure I could make out. What was being said? If there's any way that you could um, improve, I don't know, you know, take a take thing, taking the phone off of a headset or something like that, just so we could hear. It was, it was a challenge to hear. Oh, sorry about it. Yeah, it's just a question. This is an instant update. It's back to the sixteenth, the fifth, or sixth. How could we delay until we find a better venue? As we go to holidays, celebrate. Which meant today to come together as one Yeah, I'm sorry, it's it's still not possible. It still wasn't possible to hear um, in the background. It it it. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I think it's being asked as if the fifth and sixth are in stone, or if it's possible to delay the hackfest to a, a later date. Well, these are these are things that we're hoping to have every two months. Um, you know, we could start the process. We should start the process now of trying to determine the next location. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it was it was fortuitous to be able to coincide it with this. Uh, we could look possibly for options on the seventh and eighth. Um, uh, I, I don't. I didn't get the sense that you know it was terribly sensitive to a few days on either side. Um, but it's it's. Uh, I'm sorry, ninth and tenth. Um, uh, uh, you know, but that's a Friday, Saturday, which is also tough to ask for from people, especially in the run-ups of the holidays. So, um, I my my sense would be if we can't make it work this time, we we put it on hold and try to you know put effort into determining a location and time, uh, you know, for the one that we would have two months out, um, and and look at other cities, other options, and put a broader call out for that, um, unless uh, people Brian. potentially feel differently. Brian, this is Sharon from IBM. I'll see if there's. I'm gonna. I'll go ahead and put out some feelers to see if there's anything that we could do up in the New York area. I don't know that we have a space like that, but I will. I will go make an attempt and send some feelers out today. That would be terrific, Sharon. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so, uh, any last comments on this before we move on to the next item? Okay. The next two items may be hard to come to consensus on, given we don't have um, a quorum. Uh, but, but just a, uh, I guess we could we could open some space for some conversation um, on on both of them if if people are interested. Um, the first one being on the on the ex project incubation exit criteria. Uh, we were uh, we have left open one more week for kind of comments or review on the document with the idea that we would approve it. Um, we could certainly continue that online and aim to have an approval at next week's meeting if we can get quorum there, um, or we could even try to meet quorum through email conversation as a follow-up. But it, it does it does feel pretty pretty useful to to get this past the finish line. Any comments people wanted to make here on the call uh, and and conversation they wanted to have about any of the points in that document. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to make a just a, a brief point that I brought up before, but I don't think it's actually made it into the document. That um, that code review is probably not the best way to assess security, and that we should probably have some uh, some other way of stating, you know, the requirement that we want some sort of minimal security or crypto analysis. Really valid point. Um, it's hard to know. <clears throat> I mean, I, I I do value the the purpose of status. Or the, um, I do place some value on proper reviews by people trained to look for those kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, that is actually a fairly high bar to exiting a graduation, though, for something that that should be focused, in my opinion, at least primarily on: is this a community that is able to ship code that that we believe will thrive um, from this point forward? Um, I think it's, it's appropriate to have a question about security practices. You know, can a bug be reported, a security hole be reported with the, the knowledge that that'll be treated um, with with the appropriate process and respect. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a it's pretty high bar for status. It has to be reviewed for security purposes. Yeah. So uh, I'm not yeah. sorry, Brian. Um, I'm not. I don't mean that you know we need a, a system that you know we've poured hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours into you know sort of securing the thing. Um, I just think that sort of as you mentioned, we need we need to make sure that there is a framework in place to make sure we can analyze security. Um, and re like right now, this is listed under the additional requirements in terms of uh, test code coverage, um, and that's really not a way to to assess that. So just hard, I think one of the, um, I tend to be in agreement with you, but I, I, I'm i curious as to how we view, uh, I mean, the, ex the idea behind the exit criteria is to move from incubation to active state. Um, and in looking at the life cycle document that goes along with that, it, you know, it, it really tries to capture the sense that um, of completeness um, uh, both in the code base, the test coverage, and the community in its establishment. Um, I don't hear in the description, I don't see in the description um, that it's perfect that way. Now, given the, the context in which all of us are operating for most of these projects, security and um, some attestation that it will do what it says it does seems rather important. Um, I, is there is there a middle ground? I mean, I thought I thought that the some form of security review is a good part of the exit criteria, but to expect too much at the graduation point seems um, it seems like a lot of extra work. So by placing it under additional requirements, um, we've uh, actually um, it, it's something that is according to defined at the onset of the and considered as goals to be met for education. So these are things that I would see the TSC saying to a project, look, you know, like if your project in particular is a cryptography library, right, um, something very, very low level, we we believe that in order to, um, you know, make the claim that this, this code is in this community is ready for prime time, you know, in particular, you need to, to have your security uh, claim uh, you know, uh, 
of test suites around all of the claims that you're making. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily be required of other projects um, because they're maybe not as as, uh, so, as defined that way, right? Um, I mean, this, the additional requirements is basically a, a, a door through which the TSC could add additional requirements that they're choosing. Maybe that's too much of a door. Maybe that's too much, um, uh, putting too much on the TSC uh, to, uh, to add that, you know, and perhaps it opens the door for unfair treatment of one project over another. I don't know. Um, but do we want the idea of these additional requirements the TSC can place? And if so, what are the constraints on those doors, on those requirements? Well, this this is Jeremy. I think, um, I was going to just suggest if if all we do somewhere, whether it's requirements or incubation or somewhere else, just make sure that somewhere somebody's addressing what it means to be enterprise ready and whether or not this thing, how this thing is approaching that. That might be a way to attack it. Yeah, so so a couple points here. So first all first of all I, I don't think I was clear enough. Um I don't want to place, you know, excessive requirements before sort of something exits incubation. My complaint here was mostly that the document sort of implies that code coverage is how you test for security and crypto readiness, which I, I don't think is correct at all. Um so so I just think the document should be you know, corrected in this sense. Um, you know, I would like to see, you know, sort of some uh, some plan of security, but I mean, that's that's not set in stone and, and, you know, we can talk about that. And as Jeremy points out, you know, we probably need at some point some sort of definition of, of enterprise readiness as well. So I agree with him on that. Brian, just a question. Um, given that, that this move from incubation to active sort of represents some form of rubber stamping by the um, by the working group, um, what are our legal liabilities in this case? Uh, in particular, with regards to security um, and what we actually attest to about the about the particular security properties of a project. Do we have uh, any? Yeah, if if Mike Dolan is on the line and I can put him on the spot um, uh, to uh, to answer that, I'll, I'd probably be, be happy here, Mike. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, my take that you know we largely disclaim all suitability for purpose in the license. Um, so there's no legal liability here. Um, I think we'd always want to be careful about public statements we make <laughs> that sound like warranties or promises. Um, uh, and there's some, you know, uh, gray area where, you know, some, some folks are agitating for legislation that would not allow creators of software to disclaim liability, um, but they can set it aside, I think. Um, uh, because the expectation with open source is use at your own risk. Um, I, I do think the question, the, the real question is, what's the reputation we want to develop as a project for the trustworthiness by default of the code that people obtain from, from Hyperledger? And, <clears throat> and I would pitch for that to be pretty high. In fact, I've got um, a, a, a job post uh, close to being posted for um, somebody specifically to work for us at Hyperledger at the Linux Foundation, whose job would be to raise the profile, the security profile of the project uh, by implementing everything from a security reporting process and bug bounty system in the long term future to, you know, uh, uh, repeatable testing frameworks or relationships with academics who can help come in and vet the code, you know, these sorts of things, um, or themselves be, be technical enough to perform parts of that review. So I'm, I'm very desirous of that um, public reputation being as high as we can make it. Um, uh, the formal liability we carry, uh, I'm obviously interested in that being as low as possible. Um, and I think it's the, the expectation is that it's, it's caveat emptor. Yeah. But, uh, but we can do better than that. Hi, this is Ben Devin. Yeah, I told you to that statement. Um, although we are incubation, that we should really be able to repeatable possibilities on um, identifiable standards that will allow us to understand uh, where any gap might be, so that we can ensure that testing is performed and sound enough for any 
whether that's moving from incubation to uh, a general use um, um, for consumption by, by a larger community. So yeah, I mean, and even if we started, we may not have all the requirements, but we could start looking at the UN the tech cases and therefore the tech man to identify any gaps for cryptography, uh, for example. There may be certain categories that will be missing already um, in the overall tech plan if there is one. Um, mm -hmm. So we can say we do have a found product that can now move uh, forward to migrate from the incubation phase. And I think that's important for our credibility as well to show that we have good standards in place to move forward. So I hope to say that bit. Okay. So, in a just so, to, uh, to see that, do we have a test plan that can be reviewed to ensure that even if we don't have a full set of requirements, that there aren't any sort of um, you know, really glaring gaps or areas that are of concern that we should address to ensure we have a strong product that can be reviewed? Can we adopt that approach or are we following this approach? Uh, is, is this Leonard speaking? Yes, it is Leonard. Sorry. Uh, it's it's been really hard, at least for me, to to get more than one word out of four um, from the audio. I I, I apologize. I, I hope it's not a problem on our side. Uh, yeah, I do uh, apologize. I'm I'm just very really far away. Um, is that any better? Is that much any better, better? Much better. Okay, much wonderful. Better. I do apologize. No, I was just saying, we always have to um, proceed on a, a standard sort of a robust way because we have to give the impression and the understanding that this is really um, a foundational effort that might benefit all communities. And therefore, we've dotted I's, cross T's, done as much robustness testing as we can before it moves some intubation out into the community space. So we need to have, and, and I'm speaking as an architect, we need to have a standardized way of doing that for four hour releases, testing four hour releases. And, and it could start now because we may not have a full set of requirements by having a test plan that the membership, all of us can review to identify any sort of glaring omissions or areas of concern that we should address now before the product moves on from incubation. So I'm just putting this out there. I don't know if we are following that approach already, or that's something that we could look at and give us that comfort feel that we do have a standardized process which would normally help us to identify any issues or areas of concern right now before it moves on, because all of that, uh, our credibility, reputation rests really on being able to do, provide that robustness for our releases. That was all. So, so, so the, in the interest of, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, but this is Arno speaking. I just wanted to try and reframe a little bit the discussion on one point, which I think is critical, is that, you know, we went through this before when we discussed the project life cycle and the, uh, and the executoria, as a matter of fact, uh, and th th there is a, you know, we seem to struggle again with this notion that what we're talking about is the project manu project maturity level as opposed to the product maturity. And um, and I think that's very important to keep in mind what we're talking about here. I mean, my ex you know my expectation here is that the executive area really are a way to figure out whether the community, in a way, you know, is really you know as proven that it's a functioning community. It doesn't mean that their code is you know bulletproof and and then you know is highly secure and all that stuff. I think you know we went down that path before, and we eventually agreed that okay, you know, getting into the product maturity, you know, criteria business is a different dimension that is worth looking at, but that is not what this is about. Let me let me propose so, then, as as uh, you know, to, uh, just just to, so that we can move on to some of the other agenda items, um, but not to leave this hanging too much. Um, I, I would actually suggest we drop the additional requirements portion of this document. Um, uh, all of the three of these additional potential requirements um, are things that speak not to the maturity of the product community, but of the product 
And to Arno's point, there may be good reasons to define objectives, you know, cross-project criteria for these kinds of things, especially for security, but we perhaps should track them separately. And, and the incubation phase, and this is me editorializing, shouldn't be something that projects, you know, linger in for, for too long. It's something that really is about aligning them with the, with the project from a community perspective and the infrastructural pieces in place. Um, and that things like scalability really isn't 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 tied there. That might be a criteria for for calling something 1.0, but let's let's talk about that elsewhere. Um, any any uh, disagreement with that idea uh, or agreement? Uh, so Brian, uh, this is Ram Jagadishan here. Um, so uh, just want to kind of uh, say, you know agree with some of the earlier points that we don't want to set the bar anywhere close to the requirements that a product would have at this stage. But given the area that we are in, it seems, uh, you know, security is a paramount requirement in terms of, uh, you know, having a really enterprise-grade solution. So um, even if it is some checkpoint which says, do you have a security review plan or, a, 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 you know, code security uh, audit plan, uh, might be better than having nothing at all, that's my opinion. And the second thing I wanted to check was it seems like the Linux Foundation has a critical infrastructure uh, effort that's going on, and I was wondering whether they have a best practices recommendation opposed to this. I mean, and the real question is if we don't want security to be an afterthought in this space. We want it to be an essential component. And so I, I don't think it, uh, having some kind of at least a uh, checkpoint which encourages very early thinking about security requirements, um, I think that would be a very desirable feature to have. Yeah, the CII does actually have a checklist like that um, that open source communities go through and, and they are, are about the community and process than they are about the, the code itself. And so I'll, I'll dig that up and send that around um, and that may be appropriate, but I, uh, but specifically the points earlier, not uh, in that requirements document, not the additional requirements section at the bottom. So the additional requirements section is um, kind of, it, it, the lead into it is, a, is set it up as something that uh, is a, a nice to have rather than a requirement. Um, it, it, is there a way that we can, okay, I'm supportive of projects thinking through the set of things that are in that section. Um, and some form of documenting some thinking behind it seems appropriate, um, as opposed to creating them as barriers to to uh, graduation from incubation to active. Is there a way that we can can preserve those as things that projects should be thinking about and may hold themselves accountable for, as opposed to requirements? Like maybe change the section to additional considerations instead of additional requirements. I think I think there's another document. That yeah, this is a valid, I think that's a very good approach. Not lose um, the content and the brain, uh, you might say, the, the, the scenarios that have already been addressed. Yeah, but include them as con some form of consideration, a further consideration. I do agree that section would be very important to have. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to suggest, um, uh, even though even though Vin has joined and we could we could, in, uh, in theory, have to declare a quorum now. Um, uh, it, you know, I still feel like there's some open conversation. Let's let's carry this conversation on on the TSC. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, one proposal is drop additional requirements and find a way to reflect those somewhere else in the constitution of the project, somewhere codified um, and formal, uh, perhaps simply not as a requirement for graduation from incubation. Um, uh, if I may add, you. Brian, yep. just before you move on Sorry. quickly, I just wanted to add a little bit of background so that everybody knows. I mean, you know, I was the editor of this document, and so this section was 
put in the way it is as kind of a trade-off, right, as a mitigation uh, uh, to between the people who wanted more and those who wanted less. And so I, you know, I would, even though personally I think we could drop the section, I would not feel comfortable doing this, you know, by fairness to those who accepted the document on the basis that we had that section the way it is. So at the very least, we have to answer the question of to, uh, you know, of where does it go if it's removed from there before we remove it. Okay. Okay. Let's let's do that on a TFC call. Then, um, uh, uh, moving on to the next action item, um, the China Technical Working Group. I have no update uh, to give on this. Uh, I needed to put it together into something formal and and work with the um, China community here to define co-leaders for that. Um, ball is in my court. I apologize for that. Um, uh, I'll get this this prepared and then ready to discuss at next week next week meeting. Um, uh, I'll actually be in Shenzhen for a day on Friday, coincidentally. But um, uh, yeah, uh, this is this is on me. Uh, uh, as, next, you're, um, as you're getting that together, I, I guess one thing that will be important to me on that is is having mechanisms that prevent there from being any sort of uh, fracturing of of the hyperledger community. So anything right. you know, if there's there's discussions that don't kind of go across both sides of that, that communication flow, that would probably start to create problems. So anything we can do to, to uh, keep that from happening, I'll be, I'll be interested to hear about that. Right. And, uh, um, you know, largely it'll hinge on the, um, the, the, the chairs, the co-chairs that we name, um, you know, making sure that they monitor for that. Um, we also do have um, uh, Chinese speaking members of our staff who will be on the, the discussion and monitoring for that. Um, and, and I think in the framing of the charter, I think it'll be, we'll, we'll put language in that helps describe how, how this should really be a bridge um, while still meeting, meeting the needs and, uh, uh, of, the, of the China community. So I think it's a very good point and something for us to both code into the, the, the description but also monitor for. Okay, and really quickly, um, we're putting together some thoughts around an internship program um, this summer uh, where we will uh, sponsor uh, and, and pay for some number. We haven't decided yet. Um, hopefully, hopefully up to six. Uh, uh, you know, we still have to work that into the budget. But uh, um, uh, interns over the summer who will work from home so they can actually be from anywhere. It'll look a little bit like Google Summer of Code. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what we need for a process like this are volunteer mentors who are willing to to bring developers into their um, you know under their wing. Um, uh, they'll be college students. They'll be people who we can expect some fair degree of self sufficiency from when it comes to learning how to code. But we'll probably need plenty of guidance on getting into into our different projects. And so. Um, we'll send out a more formal call later, but this is a, a, a seed planting to uh, um, say if anyone wants to be a mentor for that um, or wants to participate in defining the program. Um, uh, that would be, if the door is open, we'd really love your involvement. Hey, that's great. I look forward to hearing about that. And myself, Leonard, most certainly I'd like to participate in that. Okay, so we've got Leonard, and who was it just before Leonard said that's great? Uh, this is Dan. I'm okay, sure great. we can find a, a mentor in the Sawtooth team to uh, to work with an intern or two or three. Excellent. Excellent. So this okay, is Mark we'll Wagner. That. Mark Wagner at Red Hat. We'd love to have an intern or two to help. Okay, we've got three of you recorded. Um, and uh, we'll we'll be in touch, and, and again we'll send out um, a broader note. But uh, thank you very much. Um, so why don't we move on to Dan? Did you want to give a, a quick discussion or, or uh, a presentation on the uh, marketplace navigator? Yes, I don't really have a, a presentation set up. Really, just wanted to to make uh, 
an announcement or or just update on the the progress that we had said earlier in the fall we had some some code within Intel that uh, could be contributed out for the uh, for the block Explorer project and so it took a little while to get that uh, unentangled from from some other work but that has just been uh, released into uh, we put it into the sawtooth repository for starters uh, but then that can now that it's got all the the proper licensing on it it can be uh, copied over entirely or in whatever parts are beneficial to the Explorer project. Um, it's probably best not to think of it exclusively like a, a block explorer uh, because that's uh, maybe a, a subset of what it does. You could maybe more properly think of it as a client side, sorry for the background noise there, uh, as a full uh, client user interface, uh, one that's designed to work with our example marketplace uh, transaction family. And so again with, with Sawtooth we have a concept of uh, transaction families that, that encapsulate business logic for, for a given domain or, or set of use cases. And so this this client UI is set to uh, to play a role in that marketplace transaction family. So that would be that would be inclusive of the things that you would think of a of a block explorer. Can I, you know, find a, a specific uh, block ID and kind of uh, dig into that, but then it's got the logic that would be specific to what is the guts uh, of that block, and you needn't necessarily interface by by trying to find block numbers or, or something so uh, terse as that. But you've got a, a regular interface to um, conduct transactions as well. Um, and while that's set up for the marketplace, it would be uh, a pattern uh, that a pattern that that we've used also in in some other uh, in some some other work that's independent of marketplace, so that you can use that same style of of design for uh, bringing up other sorts of business logic and being able to transact and inspect the the ledger for those kinds of transactions. So I, I think that's probably uh, enough for, or as much as I, I intended to say about it. But there's a, a post out to uh, technical discuss from from the engineer that worked on on putting most of it together. That's uh, um, also participating in the the Explorer project. So the the links to the the code I think are also in that, along with uh, pretty good documentation about what it is. Is this something that seems like it's very tightly associated with um, the Hyperledger Explorer, or is this the kind of thing that could be its own um, independent project? Um, that's what I was. It wasn't clear on when I was reading the description. Well, so it's it is bound to the marketplace transaction family that would be part of Sawtooth, but there's probably two levels of patterns there. So in the in the most abstract sense, you could take just a, a subset of what's there and use that for the Hyperledger Explorer project. Uh, and there, I think, the challenge with the Hyperledger Explorer project is what's a common API to any Hyperledger um, ledger. Uh, and that might turn out to be a very small set of things. But then the kind of the next abstraction out from that is what would you do to create a user interface generally? And there's some patterns there of um, you need some kind of web uh, middle tier that's able to interpret uh, what's what's available in the blockchain. So if if you look out at, at a couple of the different explorers, like uh, like if you look out in the, the Bitcoin space at at Abe, uh, what was done there a long time ago was um, basically importing that blockchain into a relational database and then being able to do queries against that relational database. Uh, and that that seems to be an effective pattern. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a relational database, but you're kind of interpreting, uh, taking one form of, of database being the blockchain and putting it into something that's more, um, that's already equipped with tooling or, or existing uh, libraries 
that lets you have a, a richer interface put on top of it. I think the the alternative pattern that, that you would have to develop is is putting a lot of that uh, query expressiveness into the the validator itself uh, and turning it into more of a a, a web server or app server directly. Uh, and I think there's there's probably some there's upsides and downsides to that. But I guess I'd, I'd take the the stance for now that that's that's got negatives because it draws away from its core role as a uh, um, uh, consensus and um, uh, well, the, the validator itself, as opposed to making it be some sort of um, web server-ish kind of utility. Okay, I have some more questions, but I'll follow up offline with them. <clears throat> Any other questions for, for Dan about the project? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so that leaves us with just about 15 minutes for us to discuss a new proposal for a project um, uh, called Cello. Is uh, Bawa, sorry, is, uh, is he on the line? Yeah, but I'm here. Oh, and there's your there's your slide deck. Okay, Let's take it away. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to make the presentation. However, uh, we do not have the quorum today. I, I'm wonder how can we do the voting later. Well, I think I think it'd probably be worth uh, demonstrating uh, and and uh, for you know walking through your presentation for for five seven minutes. No, don't linger too long. But okay. Make it, um, open to co co questions and then. Um, we can carry on follow-up conversations online and maybe discuss it at ne next week's meeting again. Um, and if we did achieve quorum there, maybe it's uh, something that could be approved there. Okay, cool. Then I will go through the slides. So uh, today I'm presenting a proposal called uh, Shallow. And uh, uh, it's actually a blockchain service in a blog platform. And uh, everyone uh, can see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 So why why do we have the shallow uh, today? If uh, for the uh, hyperledger users, uh, actually uh, take the fabric uh, for example, the chain code developers, if they want uh, some uh, blockchain, then uh, it uh, he has to use the existing setup docs and uh, those scripts to manually set up a chain for himself. And uh, it was seen uh, in the Slack channel. Actually, numbers of people made some uh, difficulty uh, to build these uh, chains, and it was uh, lots of time. So, so we designed the shallow uh, to uh, offer uh, the blockchains in an automatic and efficient way. And uh, this is the main scenario what 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 shallow can do. The underlying, we can uh, leverage the existing uh, infrastructure like the bare metal servers and the water machines. And uh, using Shallow, it can uh, leverage those physical resources and uh, build a, a, a blockchain pool for, the, for those users. And uh, the Shallow was designed to uh, follow a very friendly framework. So it uh, opened to uh, those existing uh, infrastructure tools like the uh, utilization uh, platforms like OpenStack and those container techniques. And also we provide a uh, very friendly uh, portal and uh, REST server API uh, for those uh, users and the operators. So uh, this is uh, the main feature uh, of today's uh, Zello. Uh, uh, mainly it can manage the life uh, cycle of those blockchains and uh, can uh, respond to uh, the blockchain request. Also, it, it supports some uh, customization parameters. And uh, uh, we, we, we today we support the uh, Docker and uh, both Swarm at the infrastructure layer. And we do have plan to uh, let it uh, to support more infrastructure tools like the Kubernetes and the resource. And uh, um, also, um, uh, we we have a uh, we have a test to deploy Celo with different uh, architecture like uh, from D Power and uh, uh, x86. 
and some bare metal cells and uh, what you uh, machines it uh, all, all makes sense and uh, we also can extend it with uh, those uh, uh, open source tools uh, for the monitor and log and the uh, healthy uh, watching so uh, actually there are more to do HM on the spec uh, here I just highlight to uh, one is to support more underlying uh, structure tools and uh, like Kubernetes and Mesos and uh, the other one uh, we, we, we we, today we uh, support the hard ledger fabric, and we want to support more hard ledger uh, platforms like the Sotus Lake and the Iroha, and the code is uh, on the GitHub. So this is the um, design architecture of Shallow. Uh, from the architecture, you can see the uh, components are decoupled uh, from each other. So um, this can make it uh, very convenient uh, for uh, for for a plugable uh, design. So if you want to replace it, uh, one component like the monitoring or like the health water uh, with existing uh, solutions, it, it's very uh, convenient. Uh, and uh, 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 from the beginning, uh, we designed a shallow to uh, try to uh, cooperate with existing tools in the hard ledger community. Uh, like the, those set of uh, scripts and the, also the existing blockchain explore project. Actually, Shadow can be a very important com complaint for uh, blockchain explorer. Uh, the, the typical uh, scenario will uh, be that Shadow can help uh, create a chain and uh, uh, the blockchain uh, explorer can handle that chain and uh, show the status of the uh, chain. So. That's me about the uh, proposal and in question. Thanks. So as part as um, so as part of which blockchains are supported? This is Morali from DTCC. What blockchains do you support currently? Other than uh, I'm assuming Fabric. Uh, what? Yes, currently we already support the Hyperledger Fabric. And that we have plans to support the other, like FTL and Iroha. Just fabric for now. Yeah, yeah. Currently, it's fabric. Hey, hello. Uh, it's Victor from Huawei. Hey, Baoha, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Very clear. Uh, I, I, I have a question about uh, the architecture, Victor. What does COE driver stand for? Uh, you mean you mean the container the, driver or the the, the COE driver? driver. Uh, actually, it's the container arbitration uh, engine driver, like uh, the, those to to support uh, Swarm or Mesos or okay. Kubernetes. Kubernetes, I see. Uh, yeah. And uh, I have a question. It it uh, looks like uh, a few to open uh, stack or Magnum to containers. Uh, so I can consider it as a deployment tool, but to grow into a bus platform, I think we should more focus on uh, functions like uh, monitoring, logging, and uh, health high availability. Uh, I have read your documents. You have mentioned that uh, there is a plugin mechanism and you can integrate third-party uh, tools for these functions. I want to know which tools do you support in our days? Uh, you mean for log or for? For, uh, for monitoring, logging, and uh, uh, health water? Yeah, actually, there are many existing tools uh, to collect those uh, monitoring data and the logging data and uh, send to the database. And then you uh, use the uh, portal, we can, we can see the statistic uh, view. Uh, currently, I have uh, uh, written uh, a monitor collector using Golang, and uh, our logging, uh, we have our designed uh, logging collector, and we also have uh, uh, support uh, one existing logging collector. Uh, the name is uh, Logspot. You you can uh, find it in the in GitHub. Okay, Logstash. Do you mean? Um, lo actually, Logstash is only one one of the solutions. 
there are many like uh, log collectors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm running for DDCC again. Um, okay. So I, I I heard I saw the mention of blockchain explorer. You know DDCC, Intel, mm -hmm. and uh, IBM. We are working on a blockchain explorer. So you know, is this something different, or do we want to integrate our efforts into this, or how does this work? Actually, I, I think uh, Blockchain Explorer and the Shallow can work together uh, very well with each other. Uh, the, uh, from uh, as far as I know, the Blockchain Explorer is focus, uh, only focus on one existing chain, right? It will uh, see, uh, it will help people to see the chain leaders and uh, do some operations on that chain. Uh, while uh, Shallow focus on another perspective, it, it's uh, it's focused on the manage the life cycle of the chain. And also, it, it can support multiple chains. So the the, the is a very good a, a example is um, uh, using Celo, you can like create a chain very quickly, and uh, then that chain will uh, be bind uh, to a one blockchain explorer automatically, and then you can provide the blockchain explorer to the user, and then he just uh, you explore the chain using the blockchain explorer. But I think we should combine efforts there. Yeah, yeah. But I think we should combine efforts there rather than. I mean, in terms of initiative, this is a very good initiative. Hello, right? Yeah. It sort of combines multiple uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technologies. But I think maybe we can talk yeah, yeah. offline in terms of the blockchain explorer part of it. Yeah, uh, actually, last time I, I checked out the blockchain explorer, uh, there is some uh, basic framework. Uh, I, I, I would be interested if you could introduce uh, when we can get some release version of the blockchain explorer project. Sure, sure. So, so we'll get in touch with our DDCC folks here who are in active development, and we'll talk to Intel, uh, IBM, and other folks too. And get it all on the same page. Yeah, uh, I, th I think similarly, uh, you know, outside of the the blockchain explorer portion and for uh, launching things, be it be it Docker's or native instances, uh, monitoring. There's uh, there's some tool chain within the Sawtooth Lake project, and it's probably worth uh, doing some uh, doing some. Uh, idea exchange, some cross pollinization of what's already in that tool set that could be incorporated here or uh, vice versa. So, for example, yeah, yeah, uh, hey, hey. oh, hi, Bala. This is Leonard. Um, as an architect, I just want um, to ask with regards to this framework you put together, architecture framework, um, that's good. I like that. But uh, we have um, a guided principle. For any solutions to be highly scalable and secure, could we therefore look to deploying this architecture with any additional components, say, into the cloud to ensure that we have a very flexible solution which can scale even at a cloud level um, for the future? I just want to ensure that these are concerns that we are looking at considering in our overall architecture design. Has that been considered at all? Will we need to at some point? Uh, say, for example, let's uh, say you have Hortonworks as a, as a big data platform, which can exist sort of as a standalone servers um, within a premise, but can also be deployed in the cloud as well for further scalability. I think that's a good standard approach we should address. I just want to make sure that we've given that some consideration. Yeah. Yes, and uh, actually, um, the the shallow project has been adopted in uh, several cloud uh, environment. Uh, one of the uh, the cloud environment has used it for uh, nearly half a year and uh, support thousands of chains. And we also uh, adopted it in some individual uh, uh, projects. And uh, both uh, from both the experience, it uh, it can support. So. Yeah, and uh, uh, another uh, fact is uh, today there are some uh, commercial solutions on 
blockchain as a service. And uh, I, I guess it will be cool if we can make it an initiative for as an open uh, source solution. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Hey, this is, yeah, this is Mike. Um, just uh, so I mean, it looks like you, you talk about lifecycle and some things like that, um, and it sounds like this is really a tool that will uh, that's targeting simplification of kind of prototyping and proof of concept kinds of things. Um, uh, are, do you think that the facilities that you're providing here um, are or can be matured into something that could manage um, long-running production chains? Is this you know, is there sufficient monitoring um, and forensics to be able to do uh, kind of live debugging, for example? Mm, actually, I guess um, it, it, whether it is supposed a long-running or experimental, uh, may, the means uh, depends on the uh, the maturity of the on of the underlying uh, uh, chain. Um, uh, chain platform. Um, actually, it just help to set up the the chain and uh, uh, and uh, do some uh, operational operation, do uh, do some operational uh, um, collections, data collections on that chain. So it will not affect the chain running. Uh, um, through our uh, evaluation uh, of nearly half a year. The shallow platform itself is uh, is very stable. Great. Is that answering your question? Um. Um. Sort of. I mean, we found that we needed when we were running a couple of the internal POCs. Um, yeah. We found that the tools that we used for doing orchestration for um, kind of prototyping testing purposes, you know, for things that lasted a couple of days. Um, the tools for that were very different than the tools we needed for something that we ran for three months with an active user community. Um, and so I'm yeah, just yeah, curious yeah. if you've got experience with um, and if you've got some insights into how to extend this out to something that would be useful for something that would run for two years. So, so just so, um, the yeah, way presume yeah, we will ever get to the point that we have the blockchains that are running for two years. I, I want to do it yeah, uh, here, here at the top of the hour. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I hate to cut this off. This is an interesting conversation, and it should be continued. Um, uh, I would actually suggest it continue on the technical steering committee list. Uh, I just want to be uh, timely because we do have people with other, other calls and meetings and such. Thank you for uh, to Bawa for the presentation. Thank you to everyone for the questions. Um, and uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation online. And let's see if we can tee up a uh, critical mass to be able to move this forward at the next next week's call. Um, thanks, everyone. Sure. Thanks, thanks Brian. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Bye.